The Bretons, in ten generations of elven intermingling and slavery, had become scarcely recognisable as humans. The Nordic hunting party instinctively attacked their newfound neighbours, thinking them to be a previously undiscovered strain of Old Mary. It was only when the last survivor cried out for mercy in broken Nordic that they realised this mongrel race was their distant kin. It makes me wonder, what did those men of Skyrim see? A fey race of tall, lifesome, pointed-eared elves, with an uncanny grasp of the arcane. According to notes on racial phylogeny by the Imperial Council of Healers, all races of elves and humans may mate with each other and bear fertile offspring. Generally, the offspring bear the racial traits of the mother, though some traces of the father's race may also be present. Having newborns adopt the race of the mother is convenient for game mechanics, as it averts the problem of having a network of crossbred races to design and implement. But in the lore, the Bretons are the prime example of the very real results of crossbreeding. Imagining the Bretons as scarcely recognisable to other men is intriguing. It makes them truly unique. And that's without even broaching the many ways crossbreeding may affect their culture. The divergent beliefs of men and Mer are a constant source of tension between the races of Tamriel. Many conflicts and power struggles have been ignited by these polarizing values, and the most reputable text on the creation stories of mortals, the Monomyth, begins by establishing this crucial fact. It says, The schism in the human Old Mary worldview is the mortal's relationship to the divine. Humans take the humble path that they were created by the immortal forces, while the Old Mer claim descent from them. It doesn't seem like much, but it is a distinction that colours the rest of their diverging mythologies. When we look at the diverse races of Tamriel, and the innate discordance between man and elf, it's hard to imagine how a crossbreed between the two could be anything but fascinating. This is a race born from contradiction. This is a race born from the convergence of wildly different cultures. So, let's take a look at Hyrok to see this truly distinct race in the flesh. Oh, wait, this is just medieval France. The Bretons are half-elf? I can't tell by looking at them. Maybe I shouldn't judge a book by its cover. I'm sure their cultures and religions are unique. Oh, it's just typical medieval feudal society, with an emphasis on knightly chivalric values. And their religion is just the divines. They don't have their own Breton-exclusive hybrid of their old Nedic gods and their new elven ones. Well, shit. Hey guys, it's Drew here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Before I'm dragged through the streets and bombarded with rotten vegetables, let me say that I was of course exaggerating. There is more to the Bretons than that, and I'll cover it all in this video. The temples and their knightly orders seen in Daggerfall are definitely cool. There are rumours of really interesting factions, like the horsemen tribes of the Bjorsi River. There's also some really badass concept art of their cities and garb that stand out from the typical Western Middle Ages aesthetic. And we can't forget the Reachmen, who share blood with the Bretons, but I'd argue that they're a distinct people of their own. It really is hard to throw the Bretons a bone when most accounts of High Rock and its inhabitants, like the one in the Pocket Guide to the Empire, say things like this. Although the Bretons are divided into numerous mutually antagonistic factions, to the outsider, a singular uniformity in dress, architecture and customs prevails throughout the land. Bretons are not an imaginative people. Their villages are pleasant collections of half-timbered structures of one or two stories, with the rustic inn, a shop or two, and perhaps a lordly manor completing the picture. The traveller needs not visit more than a handful of Breton communities before satisfying himself that he has captured the flavour of the whole. The people too, despite their cherished particularism, are remarkably similar in name, accent and dress throughout the province. It may be that this unacknowledged homogeneity bodes well for the future harmony of High Rock. Harmonious or not, I'm convinced at least half of you listening to me read that quote have fallen asleep. But for those of you still awake, I promise that that's the last time I'll describe Breton architecture to you. In this video, I'm actually not going to be making fun of the Bretons. I know they're a fan favourite race, and I genuinely like them too. But I just can't help but feel like there are so many missed opportunities in High Rock. I think the Bretons are the number one playable race in the Elder Scrolls, who are in dire need of some love. 
Perhaps they'll get the love they deserve in The Elder Scrolls 6, but as things currently stand, they're woefully uninspired and underdeveloped when compared to all of their neighbours, and even when compared to the two races that merged in creating them. In Tamriel's early history, the Bretons can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about every other race in terms of having a compelling origin story. The Merefic era was a time of migrations. It is the time when the many divergent elven stocks left Somerset to settle the mainland of Tamriel. The Dureni elves chose the continent's northwest and settled High Rock, as well as the mysterious Isle of Balfiera, the home of the Adamantine Tower. Shortly after this, the Nedic human settlers arrived on Tamriel's northern shores after crossing the Sea of Ghosts from Atmora. The fate of these manifold migrations varied. Some, like the Duraki Needs of the Deflans, prospered, building great towers that looked distinct from their elven neighbours. Others, like the Needs of the Heartland, suffered immensely and were enslaved by the elves of Sirit. The Needs of Hyrok were not so unfortunate as their eastern kin, but they were by no means free. The Dureni Elves saw them as expendable commodities, something for wealthy nobles to trade and use as they please. The aristocratic Elves established a system of feudal vassalage over their human subjects, with rights and privileges that included the perquisite of coition with any human they desired. Sex with attractive needs was considered casual recreation, and Dureni nobles competed to have stables of the most desirable human subjects. The inevitable half-elven offspring from these liaisons were not adopted into the families of the Dureni parents, being considered sub mer but were nonetheless often given privileged positions among the subject needs. Over time, this led to the establishment of a recognised caste of mixed-blood humans, who were given the name Bretons, from the Elnafex Baratu or Half. The consequences of this intermingling of genes and cultures has so much potential. The differences between the Dureni Elves and the Atmora Needs were so much greater than pointed ears and an aptitude for snobbishness. The Dureni clan were Aldma. They came from the distant, perhaps fictional continent of Aldmeris, a beautiful but strange land where there are no trees, no life but the Aldma themselves. A land that appears always as an endless city, built upon itself over and over again until no nature remains at all. This interpretation comes from the ancient tapestries stored in the Crystal Tower, and may be subject to artistic embellishment, but the point remains, Oldma society in these elder days was otherworldly. The Oldma try to maintain this unique heritage even to the present day. Their gods are fundamentally different to those of the humans, and this drives a wedge of astronomical proportions between the descendants of the old and wandering Elnafe. The needs, on the other hand, were coming from a land of primeval animal totems, where giants ruled as kings, where the winter frost could freeze a man's heart inside his chest, and every denizen was therefore a ruthless predator, ensuring that only the most brutal and savage survived the winter. The combination of these immensely different peoples could have resulted in the most unique race in the Elder Scrolls. But alas, in Dureni High Rock, the Breton caste was only allowed to marry humans, so over time their elven blood became more diluted and the Nedic appearance dominated. The presence of elven blood gave the Bretons some useful genetic advantages, like a greater innate ability to wield magicka. But the Dureni influence on them ends about there. It's not unheard of in real-world history for empires to grow beyond their means and to fail to assimilate foreign cultures. The Roman Empire's expansion into Britain is the perfect example, and Hadrian's Wall stands as an immortal testament to this. Britain was a distant frontier, a thousand miles from the heart of the empire. When the Romans came, they came to stay. Over the span of almost 400 years, from 43 to 410 AD, the Empire worked to turn this province into a cohesive arm of the realm. The year 410 is remembered as the year the Romans withdrew, but of course, history isn't this simple, and the failure was gradual. In fact, many toga-wearing aristocrats living in the luxuriant Cotswolds wouldn't have noticed it was over until years later. They had built their roads, forts, and bathhouses, but the people remained British. In fact, it was the Romans who were assimilated by the Britons. Many of the imperial commanders took local wives, and the Romans recruited local British males into their ranks. 
On top of this, the gaze of the emperor was held elsewhere, in Gaul, Hispania, and Germania, making it hard to pay attention to Britannia. The Romans, of course, had an immense impact on the evolution of the region, from technological advancements like roads and sanitation, to the names of major cities like Londinium. But it was the next major foreign invasion that made a truly lasting impact on Britannia. It was the Jutes, Angles, Saxons, and other Germanic peoples who had the greatest impact on this island both genetically and culturally. The name England means land of the Angles, and the language I'm speaking right now derives from Old English, the language spoken by the Anglo-Saxons. Of course, there's plenty of Latin influence on English, like the word influence, which comes from the Latin influere, which means to flow into. But most of our Latin-derived words came later, from the French-speaking Normans. I won't keep going on about English history, but simply put, the failure of the Dureni to have a lasting impact on the needs is perfectly plausible. Breton means half, and they are called man myrrh by some, but I guess in truth they're more like man with a hint of myrrh. I'm not sure what the Elnafex language equivalent of that is, but I'm sure it's not as catchy. I believe the Breton race would be so much more interesting if the law didn't completely dilute all of the elven influence out of the Bretons. It almost seems deliberate, like in a text from ESO, which says, After defeating the invading Elysian Horde in First Era 482, Clan Dureni was scattered and effectively exhausted. As the elves retreated to Central High Rock, then finally Balfiera Isle, the Bretons stepped easily into their shoes, assuming the feudal hierarchy established by the Dureni and simply replacing them with their own noble families. The Breton nobles, who'd been forced to differentiate themselves from the Dureni part of their heritage, justified their new ascension by distancing themselves from elves and everything elven. Ironically so, as the elven blood ran strongest in the older noble families. The Dureni were increasingly vilified by their former vassals, and the island clan became ever more insular and isolationist. As I said, these events are all plausible, and it seems the origins of the Bretons is only really useful now as a means of justifying why they are such skilled mages. But does that really mean the Bretons should be such a basic feudal society with no real unique qualities? Everyone who's played Skyrim will tell you that the Nords are just Vikings, but when we delve into their lore, we see there's so much more. Their folklore, religion, and history is of course inspired by real-world Nordic equivalents, but there's plenty of lore that gives them their own identity. Magnificent Nordic ruins stand resilient against the northern chill, evoking feelings of a rich, archaic history. And from those same biting winds, the Nords believe their goddess Kine created them. She breathed life across the throat of the world, and as a result, breath and the voice are the vital essence of a Nord. When they defeat great enemies, they take their tongues as trophies. These are woven into ropes, and can hold speech like an enchantment. The power of a Nord can be articulated into a shout, and the strongest of their warriors are called tongues. When Nords attack a city, they take no siege engines or cavalry. The tongues form in a wedge in front of the gatehouse, and draw in breath. When the leader lets it out in a key eye, the doors are blown in, and the axemen rush into the city. Shouts can be used to sharpen blades or to strike enemies. A strong Nord can instill bravery in men with his battle cry, or stop a charging warrior with a roar. The greatest of the Nords can call to specific people over hundreds of miles, and can move by casting a shout, appearing where it lands. The most powerful Nords cannot speak without causing destruction. They must go gagged and communicate through a sign language and through scribing runes. The further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people become, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. The Nords fought the tyranny of dragons and won. They fought the snow elves and won, creating a living folklore in the process. Tales of great heroes like Isgrimor and his companions, like Wolfhalf the Ash King, who could uplift entire villages and fling them into the sea with a shout, or Kamua the Running Hunger, who could give clouds stomach aches and make the rain bile. And then there's Jürgen Windcaller, who had powers beyond the wildest dreams of the common man. Yet he was not corrupted, he instead meditated in silence for seven years, and founded a monastic order devoted to the proper use of the voice. I could go on and on with examples, 
the Nords of the Elder Scrolls are an awful lot more than just Vikings. The same could be said for the Red Guards. They could be fantasy copy-paste of North African or Middle Eastern cultures, but instead we have a race who could conjure ethereal swords from their souls, and whose gods learn to avoid being eaten by the World Serpent by moving at strange angles, creating a wondrous afterlife the far shores in the process. The Dark Elves are not your typical evil, midnight-skinned, silver-haired Dungeons and Dragons race. They're inspired heavily by Hinduism, Judaism, and occultic philosophies, but they're so much more than their inspirations. Just look at these environments. I don't think I need to say anything else to convince you that the Dunmer have been given so much lore love by the devs. A prime example of how Breton law feels lazy to me is the religion. When the Elysian Slave Rebellion occurred, Queen Elysia found herself in a unique position. Her rise to power would not have been possible without the help of the totem-worshipping Nords, who despised the Elven Gods. And many of the Nedic tribes of Syrid share history with the Northmen, so she needed to implement a religion that would satisfy them. But on the other hand, despite being the gods of their captors, many heartland needs were devoted to the elven gods. These were the only gods the slaves knew, so Elysia's solution was to combine elements of both pantheons to appease both sides. One of the most significant changes was to keep Shaw, the god of men, out of the picture. This is how the Eight Divines came to be. Now, if we head west to High Rock, what do we find? The Bretons also worship the same religion. But why? High Rock was mostly free from Dereni control by First Era 498, but didn't become a part of the Cyrodiilic Empire until the year 1029. In all those centuries, you'd think the Bretons would establish their own unique religion, their own interpretation on the pantheons of their elven and human forebears. Shaw, for example, was a crucial god to the Atmorans, but was not a friend of the elves. If the texts are accurate, and the Dureni were increasingly vilified by their former vassals, then you'd think they'd maybe return to their origins, and embrace their old gods. The truth is, the Bretons have largely been treated as just another human race, the western siblings of the Imperials. I mentioned at the beginning that Daggerfall's inclusion of knightly orders devoted to the temples was a cool touch, but it would be cooler still if those temples felt even remotely unique to the Bretons, and to High Rock. Even the Reachmen, who share the same blood as the Bretons, have their own completely distinct religion. Hercene is their hunt father, who teaches the Witchmen to live in the now. To the Reachmen, Hercene rules over the realm of the flesh, while the goddess of death, Namira, rules over the realm of the spirit. They even revere Periite, a deity who we hear scarce little about. To them, he is the spirit of natural order, but also time, a sphere that is usually reserved for Akatosh. They believe his plague strengthened the tribes, preventing overpopulation and gifting the lucky with disease immunity. Across the Reachman clans, you'll find many fascinating pieces of lore. I could talk about the importance of Hagravens and Briarhearts too. The Witchmen of High Rock occupy a small fraction of the territory Bretons do, yet their lore is more interesting. High Rock and the Bretons have a lot of history, and there are countless stories of court intrigue, betrayal, and implacable ambition. That's to be expected for a feudal civilization which places a lot of value on societal ranking and land ownership. But that doesn't take away from the fact that you could get a pretty good idea of what Breton culture is like by looking into the Hundred Years' War, the conflicts between the medieval kingdoms of England and France. High Rock can be explored in the Elder Scrolls Online, but one thing we've mentioned in the Fudge Muppet Elder Scrolls podcast a few times is that the quality of lore and attention to detail in ESO tends to depend entirely on whether it's from the base game or from the expansions. The Elsewhere and Merkmire DLCs added so much great lore to the Khajiit and Argonians, whereas nothing of real value was added to Hammerfell or High Rock, as the base game did not focus on one particular region. Therefore, I don't think ESO has done the Bretons justice. As for the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, I was two years old when that came out. The Bretons are in desperate need of more love. This isn't a criticism of the Bretons. I like the Bretons, but they need some tender loving care. Perhaps the Elder Scrolls VI will be the perfect opportunity. It does seem likely that High Rock will feature in that game. Maybe when that comes out, the Bretons will be the most detailed race, brimming with awesome lore, and then I'll eat my words. But for now, they're underdeveloped.
There are hints in the lore, tiny little details that could be brilliant if expanded upon, like the horsemen tribes of the Bulsi River. We see them mentioned briefly in the pocket guide, and can learn a little bit about their culture from the text called The Mirror. The story describes a horseman named Mindafrax, garbed in a bright green turban, delivering peace terms from his chieftain to another. But when diplomacy failed, the Battle of Ein Kalur broke out. The two armies poured like jewel frothing streams through the dust, and when they met a clamour rang out, echoing into the hills. Blood, the first liquor the clay had tasted in many a month, danced like powder. The high and low battle cries of the rival tribes met in harmony as the armies dug into one another's flesh. There were witches and mercenaries on the battlefield too, much to the disapproval of some of the horsemen, who made signs to the spirits above to ward off bad omens. The text later describes a horseman encampment, positioned in the high-walled garden of an old burial ground, adorned by springtide blossoms. These horse tribes actually founded the Kingdom of Evermore, as they were responsible for establishing trade routes along the Bulsi River after the first siege of Orsinium. Unfortunately though, Evermore in ESO doesn't really show any signs of this heritage, but rather looks like just another Breton city. Fleshing out the horsemen would be a great way to bring High Rock to life. At the moment it feels like High Rock is a series of rather similar cities, with nothing of note occupying the lands between them. Conflicts between nomadic Bretons who do not value land ownership, and ordered armies led by land-hungry lords would make for great drama. But can anyone truly say they care which kingdom wins any given war? Or which monarch is most fit to rule? Wayrest, Daggerfall, Camlorn, Shornhelm, Northpoint, Evermore. Aside from small differences in climate, heraldry and respective history, it's pretty difficult to tell them apart. Whiterun, Solitude, Windhelm, Riften and Markarf on the other hand, they're all very distinct. The same applies to the great houses of Morrowind and their capitals. The Bretons need some unique cultures other than just lords and chivalrous knights. Let their elven blood show, even if it's just slightly longer limbs, stronger cheekbones and pointed ears. Those changes alone would make a huge difference. And if the Bretons are so inherently skilled in the use of magic, why don't we see any magical institutions exclusive to High Rock? The Syro Nordic humans of the Nibane region conceived the idea of a battle mage, and great wizards became the ruling class in their society. These men have no elven blood, yet their magical culture is far more noticeable than anything in High Rock. These are all things I hope to see expanded upon in The Elder Scrolls VI, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And that brings us to the end of the video. Why the Bretons deserve more love than any other playable race. I hope you enjoyed the video. What do you think? How would you like to see Breton lore expanded upon in future games and expansions? Thanks for watching guys. I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.